Hello everybody, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church and I just wanted to invite you to uh, spend a little time with us here at The Vine. We are glad that you chose to worship with us today. On a special day, it's Mother's Day, so shout out to all the moms who might be watching and uh, we're glad that, uh, that you spent a little time um, getting to know God better. Um, and uh, giving him honor and glory and praise this day. So uh, I pray that, uh, that this service will be meaningful to you. And um, let's, uh, let's begin. Let's begin our worship service here at Wrightsville. I invite you now to join with me for the unison opening prayer. The words will appear on the screen, and I invite you to pray along with me. Let us pray. Lord of life, by submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being lifted on a cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restored to humanity all that we had lost through sin. Throughout these 50 days of Easter, we proclaim the marvelous mystery of your death and resurrection. For all praise is yours, now and forever. Amen. God, whose love through humble service for the way of human need, who upon the cross forsaken offered mercy's perfect deed. We, your servants, bring to worship not a voice alone, but heart, consecrating to your purpose every gift that you impart. I worship to your service, forth in your dear name we go. To the child, the youth, the aged, love and living deeds to show. Hope and health, good will and comfort, counsel, aid and peace we give. That your servants, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. I invite you now to turn with me to God in prayer. Lord, on this day set aside to honor and remember mothers, we give you thanks for our moms. We're grateful that you chose to give us life through them and that they received the gift of life from your hands and then gave it to us. Thank you for the sacrifices they've made in carrying us and giving us birth. We thank you for the women who raised us, who were our mothers in childhood, whether birth mom or adopted mom, older sister, aunt, grandmother, stepmother, perhaps someone else. We thank you for those women who held us and fed us, who cared for us and kissed away our pain. We pray that our lives may reflect the love they showed us and they, they would be pleased to be called our moms. We pray this day for older moms whose children are grown, we pray for new moms experiencing changes they could not possibly predict. We pray for pregnant women who will soon be moms. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood, for those who are raising their children in poverty. We pray for stepmoms. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. We pray for moms whose marriages are in crisis. We pray especially for moms who have lost their children. Grant them comfort this day in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for all women who have assumed the mother's role in a child's life. Grant them love and appreciation. And Lord, we pray for those people present who are grieving the loss of their mother. Grant them comfort and hope. Lord, for all these, we ask for a measure of grace 
as well as for those whom we lift before you now. Gracious God, who longs to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks underneath her wings, give us protection, provision, hope and trust for this day and for the future. In the name of your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to take a moment to uh, think of the ways that God has blessed you and um, invite you to, in turn, give back to God with a, a measure of sacrifice um, according to the, um, the measure of love and grace that God has poured out in your life. Well, it's now time for the children's sermon. So there are any girls or boys uh, who are nearby. Now's a great time to bring them over to the screen and uh, so that they can participate in the service as well. Well, hey, boys and girls, it's good to see you today. Glad to be with you. Um, this particular day, of course, is Mother's Day, a day in which we celebrate moms. And, and I started thinking about all the ways that um, all the different things in, in life that uh, make me think about my mom. And I'm not just thinking about pictures or little gifts maybe that my mom has given me throughout the years, but I was thinking more about some everyday things that make me think about my mom. For instance, um, did you know that every time I see a clock, it makes me think about my mom? Sure enough, because when I was little, my mom wanted to know where I was every minute of the day. Now, sometimes I thought that was a little annoying that I always had to check in with my mom, but it just meant she loved me and she cared for me and she wanted to know where I was. So she pretty much let me go wherever I wanted to in the neighborhood as long as I told her where I was every minute of the day. And, and that was important to her because, like I said, she didn't want me to ever get hurt. So a clock makes me think of my mom. Another thing that makes me think of my mom is inside this container, and it is an egg. That's right, an egg makes me think of my mom. Because for breakfast every morning, I would prefer to eat a donut. But my mom would make me eat eggs instead. Now, I like eggs. Um, I don't have a problem with that so much. i just rather have something sugar sweet. But my mom wanted me to eat something a little bit healthier, you know, with some protein in it. So, um, so we ate eggs instead of donuts. Why? Because my mom loved me and she wanted me to grow up to be big and strong and, um, and to be healthy. So eggs make me think of my mom. Another thing that makes me think of my mom are books. This is a big book. This is a dictionary. And um, like I said, books make me think about my mom because when I got home from school each day, um, I had to do my homework before I could play video games. Now, I didn't like that. I wanted to play video games right away. But my mom wanted to make sure that I got my homework done, that I did well in school, and so she always made me um, do the homework first. Again, it's just a way of her saying that she loved me and that she cared for me and she wanted the best for me. And finally, the last thing that makes me think about my mom that I brought with me today is uh, dishwasher detergent. Now you may think that's really strange, but dishwasher detergent makes me think about my mom because my mom always made me clean up after myself. She made me clean my room, she made me clean up my toys, she made me um, help out in the kitchen. All of these things because it was important that I put things away, that I knew wh where everything was, that I didn't lose it, or that, um, and that I lived in a, 
a safe and healthy place and she taught me how to do chores. Again, she did this because she cared about me, because she loved me. Now, I didn't like having to do all those chores, but she knew what was best. Well, all of those things not only remind me of my mom, but it also reminds me of God. God gives us lots of rules. Um, Sometimes I don't want to do them, but they're only there because God loves us and wants us to live a happy life and to take care of ourselves and that we would be healthy and happy. And so, um, so God put rules in place because he knows what's best and he doesn't want to see us get hurt. He doesn't want us to see us, um, you know, lose our way in life. So um, just like moms, God, too, puts rules in our lives to help us, not to hurt us. And we need to be grateful for those rules. And, um, and just as we're grateful for moms. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for our moms and everybody who acts like a mom in our lives. Um, Lord, we need them. Um, we are dependent on them, just like we are dependent on you, God. And so we thank you for the different rules that you put in our lives that um, help us uh, to be better people. So thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to get to bring you our scripture passage for today. Our scripture comes to us from the gospel according to John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Hear now this word. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we are people are longing today to hear from you. God, I ask that in this time, you would use me, flaws and all, to speak to your people. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. When I was in college, I had an amazing opportunity to study abroad at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. While I was there, I got to spend one day on the Isle of Iona. Now, for those of you who are not church history nerds, the Isle of Iona is sometimes called the birthplace of Celtic spirituality. It's also considered a thin place, which in Celtic spirituality means a place where the boundary between heaven and earth almost disappears, and you can sense God's presence more fully. And so, on that day in late April, I put on my rain boots and my warmest sweater, and I got ready to have the spiritual experience of my life. To get to the Isle of Iona, we had to take not just one, but two different ferries, each leading us to a more remote location. When I finally stepped off of that ferry and onto the soil of the Isle of Iona, I really could tell that I was on holy ground and I was ready to explore. I climbed up a hill that gave me a view of the entire island and of the surrounding ocean. It was breathtaking. 
After I got my bearings, I decided to make my way down to the Abbey, where the Iona community still worships today. The wind was so strong on that little island that it stung my face as I walked. But it was so beautiful, I didn't even mind. This solemn stone cross stood in front of the Abbey building, and it began to come into view. I was ready for my spiritual experience. And then I smelled it. Remember that wind that I told you about? Well, wind has a way of carrying smells. So before I saw them, I smelled them. And then I heard them. Loud, incessant bleeding. It was a flock of sheep. As I got closer and looked over this flock of loud, smelly animals, I couldn't help but think of this passage that we just read together. And then I thought, seriously, Jesus? You couldn't think of, like, a nicer thing for us to be? I hated the thought of being grouped together with these animals. Sheep are known for being dumb. Even worse, herds of sheep are always following some outside party. There aren't leaders among sheep. There's no community council for sheep. How can I be the best sheep if there's no sheep awards? I did a little bit of research about sheep and found that they need leaders and they'll always pick someone to follow. But when they pick another sheep, disaster ensues. Here's what I read. When one sheep moves, the rest will follow, even if it is not a good idea. The flocking and following instinct of sheep is so strong that it caused the death of 400 sheep in 2006 in Eastern Turkey. The sheep plunged to their death after one of the sheep tried to cross a 15 meter deep ravine and the rest of the flock followed. Wait, hold on. You're telling me that when sheep do get to be the leader, they're bad at it? Come on, Jesus. You cannot be serious about equating me and all of us with sheep. Well, I'd like to say that this is the first time that Jesus has needed to whack me over the head with my humanity and his truth. But of course, I'd be lying. In fact, in his ministry, Jesus seemed to love shocking people and flipping their understandings of the world on their head. He even did that to the Bible-thumping theologians like me, who at that time were called Pharisees. The passage we read today comes right after Jesus clashes with the Pharisees. In the passage, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. And after the man is healed, he confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. But the Pharisees aren't buying it. So Jesus then redefines blindness as not seeing what the blind man could see, that Jesus is the Son of God. The Pharisees mockingly ask, are we also blind? And Jesus responds, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Whew. It's out of this interaction that Jesus speaks. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Can I be honest? This passage used to really scare me. I used to be anxious when I heard it, wondering whether I was one of Jesus' favored sheep or just someone trying to sneak into the sheepfold. But as I started working through the passage, I realized that the person sneaking in isn't being compared to the sheep. He's being compared to the true shepherd, Jesus. This dig about being thieves and robbers is directed at the Pharisees. But it isn't because the Pharisees are bad sheep who aren't a part of the chosen few. Instead, it's because they're trying to be shepherds themselves when that is Jesus's job alone. Essentially, they're trying to play God. 
The issue here isn't about believing the right things about God or even about obeying God. The issue is whether you are willing to humble yourself enough to see yourself as part of the pack, on par with all the other smelly, sinful, kind of dumb sheep, instead of as another shepherd. If you try to be the shepherd, as the Pharisees did, and I often do, you'll be called a thief and a robber. But it's not because God is angry or doesn't love you. It's because trying to be the shepherd when you're really a sheep is dangerous to yourself and to others. You'll be trying to jump over a 15 meter deep ravine and bringing the rest of the flock down with you. But here's the good news. When we humble ourselves and acknowledge our identity as sheep, we receive an incredible blessing, relationship with the shepherd. The passage says that the shepherd calls his sheep by name and leads them. The shepherd knows every single sheep by name. This is the same shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep to seek after the one, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. When I'm lost, he'll go through the hills and valleys calling me until he finds me and brings me home safely. And he does the same thing for you. The shepherd also leads his sheep and goes before them. What a comfort it is to know that if all follow Jesus, Jesus will walk each and every step before me. There's nowhere I can go that he has not already gone. It reminds me almost of the rule that my troop leaders taught me when I was in Girl Scouts. When you were hiking, any time that you crossed a big root or a rock or you needed to jump over a puddle, you'd turn to the girl who was behind you and let them know that the obstacle was there. They'd say something like, watch out, root. Well, when we follow Jesus, we never have to be the line leader. We never have to be the first girl whose job it is to spot that pesky root. Jesus walks it all before us. Along with this comes another blessing we experience when we follow Jesus. He leads us to rest. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Sometimes these words seem impossible to me. There's just no time for rest between excelling at work, fulfilling the demands of leadership positions, not to mention being a decent friend and family member. But that's just the thing. If I'm really just a sheep, one in the flock, then I don't have to do the job of the shepherd. The shepherd's kingdom is coming, whether or not I'm a part of it. And the shepherd will call me his own regardless of the awards I receive, or the accolades I collect. He loves me because I'm his, not because of what I can offer. When I read this passage in John, I see that sheep have just two jobs, to listen for the shepherd and to follow the shepherd wherever he goes. And of course, following is related to listening. Verse 4 says that the sheep follow the shepherd because they know his voice. It also says that a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know his voice. But how can we be sure that that voice is the shepherd's? How can we know that we're really listening to God and not to an idol of our own creation? Have you ever worried about that? As intimidating as it can seem to try to discern the voice of the true shepherd amidst the noise, there are things that we can do that will help us. The first is to make space to listen. I've noticed that my prayer time is often spent trying to impress God with my theology and piety. 
I journal all of the things I know I'm supposed to and maybe even whip out a list of names for God for some intercessory prayer. To be honest, it's more of a speech than a dialogue. And when I'm not talking, I'm often reading a convenient devotional entry that shares what someone else thinks God wants me to hear. Either way, it's actually a lot more about me than it is about God. And I haven't created any space to actually hear from him. To learn our shepherd's voice, we're going to need to spend time honestly listening, even if we don't hear anything, even if the silence is scary. Try this. Try setting aside 10 minutes just to sit in total silence with no agenda. Just be with your shepherd and listen for his voice. Another way to learn the shepherd's voice is to know what sorts of things he usually says. Spend time honestly reading scripture, ignoring everything you think you know about the passage. Sometimes I like to make a list of every word that's used to describe God. When we're familiar with the stories about our shepherd, we can catch the voices of thieves and robbers and say, wait, hold on, that doesn't sound like something that my shepherd would say. And yet, for all the knowledge we can gain about what the shepherd usually says, there's a third factor that we have no control over. We have to listen for our names. Our rational efforts are important, but beyond our logic and our willpower, we have to remain open to a more visceral call. When the shepherd calls our name, we will turn in psychology, there's a theory called the cocktail party effect that describes the power that hearing our name has on our attention. Even if we're focused on a specific voice at a party or in a large group, if you hear another voice down the hall say your name, you're going to turn and pay attention. Well, the same is true here. No matter what we think we know, if the shepherd calls our name, we have to go where he follows. Where else could we go? We are his sheep and he is our shepherd. We belong to him. He loves you exactly as you are, matted fur and brokenness included. You belong in this sheepfold with everyone else in this room and all our brothers and sisters in the world. He knows and loves you individually, and he calls you by name. On that day at the end of April, I sat and watched that flock of sheep for a while. And after I got over the smell, it occurred to me that these sheep actually had a pretty great life. I could only spend about two hours on Iona. It took so long to get there that we needed the rest of the day to travel back. Meanwhile, these sheep spent their entire lives roaming around on holy ground. They were provided for and cared for. And honestly, they were kind of cute. This is the life that our shepherd is calling us to. If we will humble ourselves and be part of the flock, the smelly, ordinary flock, we will be cared for, known, and loved individually. If we will quit trying to run the show and let the shepherd be the leader, we will experience joy and peace. We will be known, we will be loved, and we will walk with our shepherd day in and day out on holy ground. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you for being our shepherd. We thank you that you are always caring for us and leading us. God, today help us to be willing to follow you, to let go of our own agendas and instead go wherever you lead us. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go now to follow your shepherd 
And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your